but you know it's insane like I, 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 there's one thing there's one thing which is common amongst the three of us is that we've all become the boomers we thought we would never become when we were kids yeah, we're like but, you know yes, we will yes, never absolutely. stop playing games and then life just hits you and you're like <laughs> oh, card you, games man. now we're gonna play card games eh? yeah you know what like i also realized like i i also like it was very comp- like uh started out as competitive back in the days when uh, it was uh, le- most of them were land events but after some time i realized you know what like uh, I-, I should not be putting myself under so much pressure right? the pressure to perform the pressure to like you know to uh like, how do i say i'm going to stay competitive right it's too much man it's too much on my like you know, on my like my mental health as, as, as well as my physical health so i decided like it's better to like make things happen for people rather than try to like uh, because first of all that's a realization that i'm never going to be good enough right so why be just average or slightly above average when you can do so much more with uh, some of the other opportunities that are available right? so I think no, I, that, that's fair of... yeah, yeah, yeah that is what i'm saying i mean like maybe oh, wait i'm going to share some uh, photos of uh, something very interesting right Oh, absolutely. I've, I've seen Romeo's old pictures when he used to play, I think with Deathmaker and the rest of the boys, all young kids and just, just having a good old time in CS 1.6. So I think CS 1.6 is all where we started, right? CS 1.6, yeah. 1.5. Yeah. Holy, right, so look this, at this. Back in the days of land. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> that's that's, C, that's CRT monitor. Uh, uh, yeah, CRT monitor. I'm going to tell you the story behind this. Uh, it's a, this actually was the canteen from our hostel right back in college uh that's me by the way with uh yes with this is this is what id correct right? read kanpur kanpur sorry and you know which year this was which was this i think it was 2000 yeah 2000 yeah 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 2000 yeah 2000 was the year when we did this land event right and and you know who are these everybody who's like playing games they're all people who flunked uh, courses during the semesters and we have to stay back for our summer courses. So one of the things that we said, okay, the, the entire hostel is empty. The canteen is not being used anymore. So why not like, you know, just uh, do a LAN event. Right? So we're going to have uh, set up the whole LAN ourselves. We have, uh, I mean, like we uh, borrowed the, technically we borrowed all the, all the, all the routers, et cetera, from the, uh, from the computer center and we just set up the LAN and we said like no sir it's going to be a very uh, interesting project that we're going to be like working on the same on the, on the land right uh and we set it up and we i think we non came non-stop for about like three days in a row uh that is the time when i realized you know what like it's more fun to do events rather than try to be competitive because uh it's just, just like uh, it was fun back in the days ah, man this unbelievable when the pcs <laughs> were like in like this look at this like, <laughs> insane oh no God. this this is insane you know this this brings back so many memories and i i Romeo and i we actually talked about this this internet legend where apparently there was a picture of a guy duct taped to the ceiling playing cs yeah we, were, yes. we were like, yes. we were like let's, <laughs> let's bring him to the podcast honestly if we can i would love to talk to him because i can't i can't imagine one scenario where that that makes sense and that's <laughs> sheer passion for the game like you know what i want to play a game I want to play a game of Counter Strike, but there's no space. You know, I'm going to duct tape myself to the ceiling and I'm going to play it. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think those were the days, right? I mean, like in the early 2000s when uh, we didn't have uh, any organizations, but just like you know, a bunch of guys uh, coming together, forming a clan. Clan. Yeah, like, you know, forming a clan. Clan, yeah. Uh, like, yeah, and like just like fishing for competitions and places where they can just go and play LAN and like the events like that. Yes, reality where you would download, like we didn't even have like a live stream. You just had to download those files that you can like replay on your, uh, on your <laughs> yeah. machine, right? Literally, Jesus, good old days, man. I'm like really miss <laughs> and- those days, but I don't miss them as well. No, there, there's one more thing that there was a very strong sense of community back in the day, right? Because there, yeah. th- while we were very competitive when it came to the games, but a very strong sense of community. Yeah. And I, I, even though, sure, we've grown, we've grown in terms of the sheer numbers of people playing games, but I, I feel like some somewhere down the line, we've actually lost that sense of community. Don't you think? Absolutely. Uh, uh, okay, so I, I think it's just... Uh... I think the the let let's try to like reframe the whole uh, sense of what 
we feel as a community because like the same thing like our parents used to tell amare is amane right <laughs> like, they start right i think it's the same thing i mean like yeah, the way that uh, they believe they are part of the community the way they interact the way they engage it's, it's so much different man like it's insane i mean like i can see the same generation gap happening when i go for like a uh, meeting with uh, other friends and they bring their kids along right and of course my kids are too so like four and five some of them have like older kids and i'm mean, like i can see the disconnect in the way that uh, they are with their parents already so they are like around 8 to 13 years old uh but the moment they get to know that i am i work for a gaming company and that too for a game that they have played in the face just lights up and they start uh, having a conversation and, and my friends get like hey they do talk to you as if they're talking to a friend right and this is what i see i'm mean, like so from us we have i'm mean, like i like we are let's say a generation ahead of what the current uh, set of gamers who are uh, let's say who are aiming to like you know, let's say to be more engaged in this community so from their perspective their sense of what the community is very different from what we believe or what we saw i think at the end of the day they they have a community i mean like you know they have the same level of toxicity that we had back in the days <laughs> except we did not have so many opportunities to be toxic right yeah, so, but, yeah true and that's it i mean like and i still realize you know at the end of the day i think we fall into the same trap of amare zaman and things were better but then, yeah like, well, we had miserable lives man. <laughs> and then, yeah i mean like you know, so we did not have any way to like you know to really express ourselves i mean like look at this like 10 years back uh, if somebody says hey you're gonna have a career like uh talking about people other people's games and as if like somebody's playing cricket and you were talking about it, it's like what the f are you saying man? you're crazy who's gonna listen to you right but now you have a following and people come to listen to mamba talk about like about know, people's games and how they're playing <laughs> it's amazing amazing um time we are living in. i'm i'm quite excited actually You know, I actually want to go off on a tangent, even though I have a lot of inter- interesting questions <laughs> for you. But th- I think you know, you talked about uh, how how different it was back in the day. We actually do not have a lot of opportunities to be toxic. Also, fair point. But the one thing I really, really miss, right, is the land culture. Yep. That yeah. the, the screaming contest, the the shouting contest that that used to be between two teams. I think it's mellowed down a bit, don't you think? Absolutely. I'm like, I I, I absolutely believe that has. Uh, I'm like, of course. it also has to do with the rise of let's say mobile gaming so where you're not like tied to lan right and also the games that are uh, e-sport driven right at the apex level right so very few opportunities and because most of them make it very easy to play online right and the difference between lan and online is like getting so ridiculously low right now so the whole concept of somebody like you know organizing a lan event the value of uh, the ROI is getting smaller and smaller right and yeah. the publisher wants to put up a show right then it makes a lot of sense but otherwise i mean like you know, the economics unit economics of land i agree and like, for the nostalgic purpose it's fantastic and also like you know the kind of content that can be created out of it man i'm like you know if you have uh, if you give me an invitation to a land i i think i'll like just buy a ticket myself and i'll fly right and that that's that's i think that's something which is is a mindset that we have the current generation i'm not sure if they get excited by land because i think they are too used to being online from wherever they are including their uh, like, bathrooms right so i guess <laughs> for the whole the whole excitement of land is like why do i want to meet them i mean like, i can give him 15 dalis right there sitting on my like shit pot right <laughs> Why do I need to go and like uh, shout it in front of him? What if he starts hitting me back, man? I don't want to take that risk. I can be more toxic, like behind my screen, <laughs> rather than face that person, right? So yes, I'm like different, very different. But I do agree. I'm like for me, yes, land any day, any day, land. Yeah, that's something I really miss, Romeo. Land culture. It's just, <laughs> it's 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 a different vibe, honestly. Yeah, the, uh, the whole like, uh, the whole city rivalry isn't there like it used to be. <laughs> oh yeah, that Bombay, Delhi, Bang. I think Bombay itself. Everyone, said, like, everyone hated Bombay because they're like, oh, in yeah, they they always make it to the finals. <laughs> yeah, I still remember yeah, I, the. I, yeah, sorry, go on. <laughs> no, no, I, I just like I remember like you know the times back in two thousand like early, uh, mid to late two thousand tens where yeah. you had so many gaming cafes in Mumbai. Like even like in these yeah. cramped places where you could not even get inside, like you know, everything was in line, right? You had to like literally like you know be on the wall if you had to like watch somebody play. 
Yeah. Still, people used to like now go to cafes to play games. There were cafes everywhere. There were so many. Oh God. So I many. I actually have a very interesting uh, so uh, thing to tell a lot of our newer. So newer generation gamers, right? A lot of times they have these questions. I, I've I've seen this on Reddit so often in the in the Valorant subreddit, in the CS:GO subreddit. They see some of these professional players hold the keyboard at an angle, right? It's some some people ah. at a 90 degree angle or 70 degree angle. They're like, why do these guys hold it like that? Because we did not have the desk space. That was a luxury back in the yeah. day. Having that desk space was a luxury, and people don't realize it's like why does like does this help you with? There gaming? was no bungee. There was, <laughs> yeah, that no was nothing. nothing. <laughs> there was no headset ka mic. It was just screaming at the next guy like cover kyun nahi diya. And like uh, you remember those days when like, I think a couple of like uh, I, I was um, I, I was basically mostly into Q, uh, Quake uh, Quake Three. So a lot of these guys used to. Play with the keyboards like in you know, the below the desk. I mean, like just a little. I mean, like they basically optimize everything uh, with the screen literally like yeah. five inches oh. from their faces. Insane. I mean, like you know. Okay, so I had the luxury of space because I was in a nice dorm room, so I had a lot of space. So for me, I, I said like, no, okay. I mean, like just to be able to do that and execute the kind of move combos that they have, it's like it must be like insane. I think they've evolved to a point where. Um, Sitting comfortable is not a uh, necessity anymore, right? To perform, yeah. yeah. Not just keyboard and a mouse. I think even mid air they'll start performing. Yeah, absolutely. I still remember this one event from I think it was a CS:GO event. Mike Lele was at an event and he could not find a chair to suit his height. And there's an image on Google. I think I'll, I'll I'll add that later on. But he was actually sitting on his knees and competing. At a LAN event, at a professional tier one LAN event, and this was still early 2010. So you know the standards were still not there, and this is where we come from. And at this point, if if the room temperature is not ideal, you know I don't. I'm not gonna play. It's too yeah. cold right now. <laughs> yeah, you're like, even even 60 ping. You're like, oh my god, too uh, high, too high. Yeah, like can we play <laughs> in some other server? <laughs> But no, that you know, it's, we've come a long way. Like, I still remember we recently. It's, I was, so, it's crazy. <laughs> it is. It <laughs> is. And the reason I was in Mumbai, right, Sukumar, so was actually for the watch party that was happening for the VCC finals. So all of us sat down together. We saw the grand finals. Insane numbers. Listen, listen. Save all of this. <laughs> Let's start. <laughs> What? No, we've, we've started already. We've oh, started. This is not. This is this is done. We'll do the intro later. We'll shoot it later. We're in the conversation now. <laughs> It's okay. Oh, we okay. don't need the intro. Yeah. Like I, I think. I think. This I mean, is, this is great. everyone knows you, so come on. Everyone knows. <laughs> no. You. No, so I, I think like uh, I I run a risk of being overexposed. I think it's almost like I get to say. So I, it's like not. Uh, Right now, um, I think uh, I have a little bit of time uh, to really go ahead and engage because I really love uh, engaging with the community. Right, I have like I try to keep uh, myself updated on what uh, people are asking, what people are complaining. I think those are the two things that are more important than people saying we like what you're doing. Right, I think what we are are the room for improvement. I think that's the something which I really like to do. And right now, I have a little bit of time. Right after VCC, the last two months have been like quite big for all of us. Um, And so now I have a little bit of time, so I have like you know uh, been postponing a lot of engagements to a point we'll do it after BCC. So you, re I realized that like for the next one week I have a lot of engagements, um, including this. That everything looks like. Now what you can't get at? Like, does he have no job other than like uh, just coming on like you know, podcasts? Yeah, that and then he's like, "Hey, he's got a court case." I'm like, "What is wrong with him, man?" It almost feels like with the same thing he's being rehashed over and over again. It's not my fault, guys. It's just like you no, know, the thing is like I've been postponing <laughs> everything after VCC, so everything is packed now. So not my fault. So if you get uh, to see me too or hear me like you know, talk about stuff, so I'm sorry. No, no, that I that's good. New. I mean, I mean, I think we all kind of know how Riot also interacts with the community, right? And I think everyone appreciates that. At least I do for uh, in terms of leak because uh, whenever I need to rant or see something about a patch note, I I would go to Twitter and I would see a lot of devs interacting, and it's it's you don't see that a lot these days anymore, to be honest. Uh, that's true. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that's one of the reasons why I was really drawn to uh, League of Legends uh, very early yeah. on because yeah. And I'll just tell you the funny thing is like you know this is something which uh, 
I have realized after like I've been with Riot for over four years now. It's yeah. only now I've realized how much of that has been ingrained, Karen. So uh, when you join Riot, so you take yeah. you go for a session called a denube session, right? So where you I'm like, let's let's uh, start. You are a new right? so you you go for a session. It's, it's a, I think it's a very good like seven day orientation program for a bunch of writers who have joined around like in the last two months. Uh, so it is that it's a beautiful program, right? And like um, subconsciously, they do a lot of. Uh, I mean, like we are run, we are we, we've taken through a lot of programs which help us uh, like invite this player first mentality without even having to make an effort, right? And it, it is it is so seamlessly done that it's now I've realized that without even having to make an effort, it becomes very easy for us to take decisions which are always going to be there first. And it has got nothing to do with unit economics. It has got nothing to do with, let's say, hey, is this even possible? It's just, do you want to do it? Let's do it, right? And I think it, it, it is a cornerstone for a lot of uh, the decisions or the approach that Riot has. And I'm, I'm, I'm super privileged to be able to like, you know, go through the program and being able to see how this unfolds over the last uh, four years of whatever that I have seen or done with the company. Right? Amazing, man. This is something which I really hope that, like, you no, know, we are able to like bring more, uh, especially when it comes to like, you know, uh, servicing our players, especially as a publisher. And I, I, I would definitely want more publishers to like you know, to have this uh, kind of approach to make sure that like you know, that they're always taking care of what is the need for people who are actually investing. Fair enough, fair enough. But again, going back to talent. <laughs> talent. I actually have a lot of questions about talent as well. You know what? Let me cut to the chase. I was actually going to ask about the viewership, the numbers, and how crazy is it to have 50,000 people watching a PC title. But this is something that I've always wondered because I've worked with Romeo on a one-to-one -one basis when he, while he was at Garena because he was also in charge of making sure you know the talent is being, being picked up for events. So yeah. you as Riot, right, for example, do you guys go out of your way to choose the talent or do you just leave it to the EO and you let them choose and you just approve it? How do you guys approach this? Yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic question, right? So it's so the way that like we approach this is like uh, the three levels, right? First is like, of course, you have the first party events, then you have the second party and lastly, you have uh, the events that are that are being like enabled by you saying, okay, right? So we have different sets of guidelines for all of them. Uh, the first party, of course, like you know, that's when we run our own leagues or our own event. Then I think we have a lot of amazing talent on on our payrolls as well, and also on contract. So we are, uh, I mean, like we have uh, award winning, any award winning like uh, producers who come and like produce shows for us, right? And for them, there's no compromise in saying, hey, I want this kind of talent. This is who I believe will suit. You give me a list of people who can like you know, uh, who can potentially plug into that kind of, uh, let's say, quality that I want, right? So then it, it is from A to Z, everything is controlled, right? Uh, for second party events, it is more of, let's say, advisory uh, in terms of consulting, uh, consultation, where we definitely work with the with, with the EO in terms of saying, hey, how, how are we approaching branding? Because I think the philosophy of like, everything has to suit the branding of the event itself, right? And I think this is where uh, there will be a lot of discussions around saying, how is the, what do we want users to feel when they see the broadcast right, or the event, right? And then over the discussion itself, I think the EU itself uh, understands or gets what kind of talent will make that brand come alive or the branding of the event, right? And that definitely is uh, more of consultation rather than saying, hey, we would like to have uh, so-and-so being part of the talent list, but uh, we do definitely like have uh, storyboards and mood boards just saying, hey, this kind of uh, personalities will make sure that the branding of this event will make it come alive, right? And of course, like you know, we gently nudge rather than uh, push for it. And as far as the last uh, set of events are concerned, which is mostly like a you know, third party, there are uh, we are, I mean, like at the end of the day, they are they have they have their own priorities, right? So we don't really try to like you know get too involved other than making sure that like, you know, guys, you know what, uh, after every event, we sit with them and ask, say, hey, after you've done the event, give us your summary of the event, things that went well for you, things didn't, didn't go so well for you, and things where we can support you more, right? And that, I think, is, is something which I think a lot of TOs now appreciate when they have to prepare the report for us. 
because there if they see that there's a gap so they know where the gap is that can be fixed next time so if they, if they have a gap in engagement or in terms of let's say hey i didn't get so many viewership then we said we sit with them we sit with them try to understand like is there something that we can do from our side can we give you some more exposure on our channels uh is it um, like do you did you read the guidelines did you need some brand assets that can make that uh, can come alive so it is a process right and that's what we have seen over the last uh, one year when we have worked with uh, our partners in the region right and we have seen them level up to a point where it becomes ridiculous it's like guys uh, i think you guys can just go ahead and do events in u and na you don't need to like uh, restrain yourself logistically to this region because you everything that you guys are doing is like you know, at the same level as some of our partners in EU and NA as well, right? So this is something which is which we see evolving. And even for India as well, this is one of the priorities that I have to see, make sure that like whoever we work with gets something out of us rather than just, uh, okay, do it or okay, we'll give you a coverage. Right? So this is how we approach. And yes, talent, something is, which we definitely want to promote a lot. Next year, I think we have, will have a lot of different programs. Uh, you'll be excited. Let's just say that like the next year when we uh, do run some of our own programs in the region. Um, uh, some of it will be focused on talent as well. And we definitely see that like the talent, it's proven, right? So for even for VCC, we saw like the maximum like the viewers came for the vernacular, what you call the broadcasts. And if that needs development, we are more than happy to like you know, to partner with uh, talent to make sure that like you know, that is the platform is available and people can really experience that quality that uh, they can really get enjoyable and at the same time surprised by what they see not here. That's honestly great news. And the one thing, actually two things I noticed. One of them was uh, third party events when you sit down with the organizers themselves and they, they write up a report and you guys try and figure out what is going wrong. It's more of a handshake than them just writing a report and sending it to you because if they they can improve upon something, you guys can always guide them. If they need something from you, they can always ask. But the second thing that I'm really excited about is talent, right? Because first party events, obviously, Riot is directly involved. They choose a the talent. There's no, no question asked over there. Third party events, sometimes the US have their own talent on payroll exclusive to them yeah. so that's a different story but for freelancers like me right so I've, yeah. I've I've been I've been with an organization for a year and a half but most of the time that I've been casting the past five and a half or six years I've been a freelancer so for freelancers when they start off especially it's very difficult to try and create their space because in in second party events for example that that is where it becomes very difficult to navigate because yeah. imagine where you might have your input sure you, you might you might want to get this talent you might want to get this talent this is what would be better suited but then again the eo has their own talent which is on a payroll so for, for an eo it makes more sense to have their own talent because otherwise why even have a talent exclusively right yeah absolutely and uh, and i think uh, as uh, next year onwards like when we bring some more uh, let's say roadmaps into the region and hopefully we will have a portfolio of games to play around with I think it, it will be very interesting uh, for multiple things. First of all, we can already see how content creation is become such, becoming such an important facet of, let's say, of any publishing strategy, right? And uh, that includes not just uh, streaming your games, but also creating content around it. And of course, like translating it into, let's say, hey, can you guys bring the same amount of energy and like you no know, uh, enthusiasm that you have for your streams or for your BODs into like you no know, events that you're doing, right? And this is something which we already see and we're trying to enable with our, let's say, uh, early access events and any kind of like you know, partner driven events where we say, hey, you know what, like, you know, can you plug uh, some people that are doing really well with their uh, streams, right? In like you know, saying, hey, if you're looking for a small like a set of uh, talent pool that you think that you can interact with, here are some of the recommendations. They're doing really well and will add a lot and they have a lot of in-depth uh, information about like what the meta is, what uh, especially around our games, right? So that's something which we try to promote actively uh, with people that uh, we really love to work with. And uh, hopefully, I mean, like like I said, next year once we have a, a slightly bigger team and uh, more programs that we can execute in the region, you'll see more of them, like let's say, uh, helping the talent side of uh, the ecosystem to come out and really shine, right? And get that support from a publisher as well. So that should, if things go well, we will have much more things to bring back to the region. Romeo, a lot of dots to connect over here. Right? People who, who, who are in the industry. I have, or... <laughs> I have a lot of questions. <laughs> go on, man, go on. 
I mean, um, I, I mean, we've talked about how much a lot of change, right? But there's one question that I would like to ask any publisher, right? What has been, you know, like, where do you think we were stuck for the longest time in the ecosystem? Like, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. So I, I think, um, from an ecosystem perspective that like, uh, you have to like, you know, uh, maybe like, you know, ask it like more, uh, fine tune that question because like ecosystem can mean a lot of things, right? Gaming, like game. Uh, publishing ecosystem is very different from the esports. Okay, ecosystem, like right? so, the whole Indian e esports ecosystem. Where do you think we were like? What what we what were we doing wrong? Like, I I guess that would be a better question. <laughs> or what are we lacking? Yeah, what lacking. were we lacking? I think we've seen such a huge boost, right? I mean, in these two years, yeah. Yeah, I, I, it, it, the answer is very simple, actually. Right now, so we have. I mean, like, no, the, I'm sure that you guys also have uh, 15 years, 20 years of experience of seeing how. Things have changed, uh, both, let's say, India as well as other regions, right? So yeah. uh, I think it was at the same state, like uh, late 90s, when gaming or the competitive gaming was, let's say, it started off at the same place because we didn't have the infrastructure to like support infrastructure uh, for gaming, uh, for competitive gaming. But I think the, the one thing that has that has really worked well for most developed countries is that they have infrastructure for sport development, right? This is something which we, I mean, like traditionally always miss, right? So if you look at the one sport that has really done really well in India, I mean, like, no, and there's a reason for why it does so well, that is cricket, right? So the reason why cricket does so well uh, is because it has been able to put the groundwork and the infrastructure that is needed right from, let's say, uh, from the grassroots all the way to let's say regional then sub-regional then national and even like you know, professional right so they have laid down the infrastructure over the last uh, 50 years i mean like you know, thanks to a lot of effort from a lot of people and no other sport in india has seen this kind of infrastructure yep. right and that is the model i mean like you know, so if you have to ask me i mean like you know, is there uh, something wrong no i don't think there's anything wrong i mean like because uh, i mean like if you look at esport gaming it's in the same state as i would say maybe soccer right where patches of things are there there is a fan base there's people who are doing events around that sport uh and there's definitely talent which is uh, crying out for exposure to let's say to go ahead and play in a better league or to have those kind of like support and backing that uh, the sport needs right it's the same state i mean like we are there uh there's no problem as such it's just being able to like not to, to put that infrastructure in place right from let's say the grassroots level all the way to the elite level right how do we make sure that like you now we have those uh, ingredients in place which will help somebody look at this seriously right the average span of let's say uh, of any competitive player is about like uh, i think four to five years after which they become, let's say that's the peak of their, uh, let's say, ability to perform at the highest level, right? And in, during the time, if you do not get the support, it just fades, right? Is, and you might have all the talent, but you do not get the exposure nor the support. And so it, it kind of dies down. But in cricket, it's never allowed to do that, right? So you are always engaged with the sport and doesn't matter what skill level you have, you have your spot, right? right from your college uh, cricket events or maybe your school events, then you have goal go for like your uh, district level, then you go for state, then you go for Ranji, then you go for uh, like the national teams and then of course professionally you go for your IPLs. Right? So this is uh, what I believe is the model that uh, we would like to see come to esports as well. And uh, for right perspective, I, I think uh, that rule book changes from region to region. Uh, some regions are more developed than the others. And from our perspective, I think SEA would be a very good model for us to like really look at and understand how are they doing esports, what are the things that they're doing good uh, to set the infrastructure in place, and how can we make sure that like you know, when we do esports or when we do competitive, we will have uh, that support system that will really help talent across the ecosystem really like you know, make sure that they don't, uh, they, they can focus on what they do best, which is play games, like play games at that level. So there's, uh, to answer your short, uh, like short answer to your question is there's nothing wrong as such, because there's an opportunity for us to really put into place, 
Right now it's chaotic, just the way that uh, a lot of things in India are. Uh, it just needs a little bit of focus from a lot of people. And I don't think that is uh, impossible. It just uh, needs to evolve and get some space. And I, I think the last two years have been great, like you said, where people are sitting up and taking notice. So you'll see a lot of uh, big things, both negative as well as positive. Uh, but when everything settles down, you'll realize that uh, the necessary foundation for a lot of things have been put into place. And I'm super happy and excited to be part of the journey, actually. Yeah, I mean, I think that's bang on point. The TLDR version for anybody who's not into long answers is that it's, it's just that we lack infrastructure, to put it simply. right? Because yes. I've, I've noticed this. The, one of the reasons why esports is so talked about right now is the, the boom of mobile internet accessibility. And people just being able to play games on the go, right? And that happened. Yeah. People started talking about about esports, and I, at least personally, on a uh, on a very personal level, I believe that we're not even in the beginning of what this country can be with regards to esports. We're not we've not even achieved one percent of our true potential because the sheer numbers one point five billion people is no joke. It's absolutely no joke, and half the country is not yet connected to the internet. So you, the sky is the limit at this point. Literally, quite literally, Romeo, the sky is the limit. I know. I think we've discussed the whole numbers game, <laughs> and Quite we awesome. were like, "Yeah, we were like, even if seventy percent of the population gets access, imagine the kind of player base we'll see. It's, it's just so crazy." <laughs> it's funny story, right? Okay, so back in uh, like the you know, mid two thousands when I started working, so there was this like you know this um, um, when internet started evolving, right? So there was this big um, I don't know how to call it like. Uh, the the usual line that you'd see in the presentations for a lot of conferences uh, around like internet and like you know, tech was that India is going to reach up to China in five years, right? Yeah. That was the biggest <laughs> like you know, lie that we were. <laughs> right? Oh and god! Like, I, yeah, uh, it, it's like. It, it, I, I I love the fact that like you know, there was so much confidence in the line that was being used, uh, especially between 2005 and 2010, the whole fact that or the concept of saying, we will catch China in five to 10 years maximum, right? When it comes to internet. And uh, I prefer, I mean, like, you know, all of us invested, or at least like our, put our, like, you know, careers into gaming thinking like, oh, if that is true, um, we are in a good space, right? Like, you know, from like, uh, so we, uh, like, you know, personally for me, I'm like from 2005 to 2010, it was a waiting game. Uh, not for anything else other than like saying, hey, this market is going to pick up uh, because at the time gaming was PC gaming, right? Mobile was still to, let's say, to expand. Console was just definitely at this end. Mobile game was a fruit ninja at that point. <laughs> <laughs> A uh, fruit ninja, yeah, 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 you're right. I'm like around like 2010, right? That yeah. was when fruit ninja. I think yeah, it was all so... temple run fruit ninja. <laughs> Good old days, man. I, I, I kind of like missed those simple games when uh, we used to play those games and like in our shitty phones. Yeah. Ah, and like, uh, so that was a that was the dream, right? Which was there, and like uh, I think uh, nobody predicted the mobile. Yeah. to be the the cornerstone right the, like nobody even thought that nokia would be displaced right, for the matter right so apple came and like at one point of time like no the uh, funny i was like i was working with a, a game development studio and uh, uh somebody brought out like a, a like a proposal from a us client saying you know what like you no know, let's build games for a platform called the iphone they, like of course, I was one of them as well. We all laughed at it. Dude, oh like, my who's god! Gonna play games? <laughs> yeah. Who's going to play games on like on this expensive phone? I'm mean, like, no, first of all, there's not too many good people who are going to buy phones. Yeah, like, yeah. And that to an iPhone. <laughs> that to an iPhone, right? Are you crazy? Who's going to make like games for that? My goodness! Like in two years, the amount of success stories we saw, especially uh, studios in uh, China. Uh, making like you know, money out of like uh, making games from iPhones for iPhones was insane. And then we realized, you know what, like sometimes it's uh, it's, it's good to be a little humble so that like you, know, you don't uh, think of yourself as like, I know everything. I've worked in this industry yeah. for five yeah. to 10 years. I know everything. This is not going to work. I think that was a very humbling experience for me personally as well to really accept that mobile is here to come, here yeah. to stay. Yeah. And, <laughs> 
that is when I switch switch gears, man. <laughs> I, I actually joined the mobile industry, like you know, where I started working with an ad network with Imobi, just to try to understand what I go get, I, what is happening, man. And after that, I've never looked back. I, I just like then I realized, you know what? Like uh, my eyes have opened. We'll never catch uh, up in China when it comes to like you know PC internet, but mobile internet is I think is where the real potential for us, and it is happening. I'm super excited. I I completely agree on the switching the team part. <laughs> I because we, we are the PC guys, right? And then I remember <laughs> when I saw PUBG doing so well, and I was watching an event, and I was like, <laughs> I was all the numbers. I'm like, is this for real? <laughs> <laughs> because I was still playing PC. Right? I mean, I still do, and I I was not sure how to react, and I saw those their numbers, and I was like, shit, this is big. I think it was just after DreamHack. I don't remember the tournament. And then I I just watched the whole games. I was like, you know what? This can happen. And then you saw PUBG, Free Fire, and then all of these things happening. And then, and then when I joined Garena, and I was like, you know what? It is possible. <laughs> I was like, okay, I I I I did switch. Like I was like, nay, you know what? It's this this whole esports. I don't think. I was very skeptical, but then when you saw. The amount of potential it has for grassroots, also. That's when I was like, "Oh shit!" You know, we we were actually, we never realized that the whole king was actually <laughs> the true king was mobile. <laughs> and then you know, I I mean, I still want PC to thrive, and I think the VCC finals was one example that shows that it can work, right? And then that's that's the beauty about esports. Right? It's not about platforms anymore. And we saw so so many people who watch both mobile and PC tune into the finals, and that's why I all I'm so against people who are like I'm PC and uh, you know I can't uh, I don't like mobile. I'm like, dude, it's it's not like that anymore. Like, come on, you play League on PC, you have Wild Rift now. Like, there's everything, you know. It's and yeah, I I, I guess esports is not just limited to one platform anymore. Yeah. Honestly, it's just about here. Sorry, go on, go on. Here's a question. I mean, like, I was just want to ask. You remember that? Uh, uh, the I don't remember which year, but like Microsoft did an amazing presentation of how they envision gaming, like um, in the future, especially cloud gaming, right? Where um, I don't even remember which game they demoed. Like basically saying you can start playing the game on your PC, then then like you have to go out to run some errands, so you just pick up your oh uh, your your mobile phone and you start playing the same game exactly where it left off. And then, like now, you go to an internet cafe and again you can play. So basically, they wanted to like say that like right now, I think in the future, uh, your form factor of the device is not going to be important anymore. It's just the game experience which yeah. is going to be seen this integrated. And it was mind blown. I mean, like, no, Jesus Christ, that is uh, that kind of like no uh, like breaks a lot of barriers and boundaries, right? I was super excited. Uh, and I really hope that one day we will get to experience that. Uh, but I think uh, most companies were delivering cloud gaming. They're not in a like not, they're not able to like match the expectations of let's say of the promises that they made. Like, it was a great hype, man. I was so. I think I think that. that's that's gonna be so sick. Plus, it's gonna be great bragging points. It's gonna be like I beat you in PC, right? Let me come from my mobile. I'll beat you. There. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then I'll come from my iPad. <laughs> In fact, like you guys remember, like uh, there was this viral video. I don't, I don't know if it's a viral video, but there was this uh, Fortnite, right? So yeah, uh, the whole pitch is that uh, kids today they're growing to be digital natives, and they're growing like you now with uh, an iPad or an iPhone as their primary device, right? So they're everything like you not know, the way that they're uh, designed to perform. Everything is centered around that, right? So there was this like you know, his older brother or maybe like you know, some cousin, like the older cousin, right? So playing from the PC. And this kid is playing from the like from his iPad, and he was kicking the PC guy's ass. I'm like, it's like wow, and it just goes on the show, right? Like you know that uh, just the mindset, right? Yeah, the, yeah, if you're yeah, able yeah. to like you know grow with the device, same. I mean, I don't think that should stop you from performing. Doesn't matter. I'm like, no, no, only PC will give me that elite aim. No, it's not. I'm like, it, it, it's that, that I completely game. agree. I completely agree. I think. I've got my butt kicked by I will not name the game, <laughs> playing that game on emulator and get caught kicked by mobile players and <laughs> it was not fun. I was so I was like I was like yeah yeah you guys have been playing for a long time. 
<laughs> the casual, you know, the usual excuse. Ah, yeah, yeah, I mean, my wrist hurts or. <laughs> oh, lag, bro. Oh, yeah. lag. I'm like, mere piece, bro. mere game pe aao. Kala na, kala na. Yeah, yeah. Kala I'm like, come, 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 velo me aao, because I know he's not yeah, gonna yeah. play from there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah that, that's the, that's the reason why I think I moved to playing card games. So it's so much easier to like not get punished because of your old age or reflexes. And instead, like no. Uh, I, I, I I saw this interview somewhere. You did say you like uh, Rune Terra, uh, Legend of Rune Terra, and you did mention that, yeah. Yeah, but I'm getting beaten by young kids now, and I have no excuses <laughs> left anymore, man. Yeah, I'm like. Uh, I hope you I'm don't end them and say I'm from Riot. <laughs> <laughs> Ban kar dunga, man. <laughs> If you beat I, I, me one more time again, God, I remember this classic from Counter Strike. My uncle works at Valve. I will get you banned if you beat me. I'm like, bro. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. It is, it's true. That, you know what? That is where I realized that uh, the gamer in me will always find things to rage at. Right. So just imagine like me playing in the office <laughs> and raging, man. Like it's like it's like. Like my uh, my colleague who sits next to me, oh yeah, what happened, bro? Is it like I freaking lost the game? Like you know, why are you so upset? Like you know, I don't know that this. I got beaten by. Okay, so I did not play the last two seasons because of which I dropped my rank. Right, so I'm yeah. just playing rank. And I was somewhere. I had to start from scratch. Yeah. Right. So when you when you think like you know what I have been a diamond player once, so yeah. I'm like I'm so fast, so fast that. These uh, kids who are at like no silver or bronze or gold won't even like no no one. Right? Yeah, freak man, I'm getting beaten by silvers and bronze. I'm like what the heck? Just happened. Like, um, <laughs> this is exactly me in League of Legends. I'm like, oh, what? Yeah. So what? So what? I miss a couple of patches. <laughs> a couple then, of patches. Yeah, and then I'm like, I, I'm gonna blame my support. What were you doing? Why are you recalling now? <laughs> <laughs> He's like you just told me to recall. I'm like, did I? <laughs> <laughs> this is the reason, Romeo. This is the reason why we'll never play league together. Never. Um, I would never, not recommend. I, I I would not recommend you to play league with me. <laughs> <laughs> But okay, you can always play Aram, right? Aram is. I think oh like, yeah, um, yeah. It's much more uh, relaxed, and I think that uh, that I'm like that was one of our team building exercises as well as 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 uh, when we went for our DNU sessions. So we were broken down into. Uh, two groups and we had to play against each other on RAM as well as Summoner Swift and I think it didn't matter right because after some time it became a super competitive game right and that's when you realize you do not know the person but you're still screaming at that person right like, okay and then after the game over it's like embarrassed right okay I'm sorry I shouted at you but it just you know that's the way we we are tuned right internally yep yep. I, I think I think Mamba knows. I don't think Sukumar should play Valorant with us. Sukumar is gonna be like, "Kya? Is he playing Berlin Finals?" <laughs> I'm so tryhard. I sometimes tell Mamba, "I'm like, what are you doing?" He's like, "Unrated, hey, bro." <laughs> and this is this is when Romeo has been Romeo has not been playing for a decade, and I literally was playing in a team last year. Okay, so I still have it. We're playing unrated at four in the morning, and I'm just I'm half sleepy and I'm chilling. I'm like, and I'm like, what are you doing? Romeo, I'm exhausted, and I'm playing. And I'm like, no, just chill. I'll we'll win the game. We and, I draw, and it's not like we were not winning. I'm I'm like super tryhard. Wait, so wait, he wait. Knows I, this. Let, let me let me let me tell you the score. Okay, I'm playing Jet. Okay, this is in regulation. Stop. I have 42 frags. <laughs> On split, forty-two, yeah. and he's like, "You're not, do- you're not, you're not <laughs> playing hard no, no, enough." No. I'm like, I, I, "This is what I said." I was like, "I was like, yeah, <laughs> you're sleepy again. <laughs> <laughs> you, when we need to win, क्या कर रहा है entry करना? मैं kill जाऊँ, मैं घुस जाऊँ क्या? And he, and he, I think, I think if we like, need to start, start talking about it and start making Sukumar the referee. Oh yeah, I think it's quite clear. Eight or nine entries with forty-two frags in regulation on split is good enough. It is good enough. Yeah, it is definitely good enough. You have my support on the book, man. <laughs> See, Romeo, I've always told you. But you know, it's insane. Like, I, 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 there's one thing. There's one thing which is common amongst the three of us is that we've all become the boomers we thought we would never become when we were kids. Yeah, we're like, but, you know, yes, we will yes, never absolutely. stop playing games, and then life just hits you, and you're like, <laughs> oh, hits card you, games right? now. We're gonna play card games, eh? <laughs> uh, yeah. They, oh, wait, wait. So, uh, my friend like sent me an. Note, right? Say, hey, dude, uh, I saw your note on Facebook about uh, an event, and I was just showing it to my kids, and they got super excited. Apparently, they played a game, right? It's like, 
Uh, I knew that you were working for a gaming company. So that's why I just said like he's talking about an event and they did really well and they got excited because uh, it's the same game that they play. And then he started asking me questions, right? So how many like now? How should we like? Uh, how should we look at the game uh, as parents? Like, you know, what are the things that you guys are uh, like uh, going to like make sure that uh, they don't play too much or blah blah blah, right? So I was giving him a little bit of advice. You no, know? okay, just play. And make sure that they don't play. I, I asked him how many hours of game play uh, game play do you allow? It's like about two to three hours a day. It just be not. I was like, no, oh no no no, that's too much. One and a half hours should be enough because the kids are still very young and their mental development, I think they need space. They don't need much uh, like stimulation from digital screens. So more than that, more than one and a half hours, right? Uh, till the age of so and so. I was giving all sorts of gyan, right? And I was uh, typing furiously in, in the car. So my wife was driving and she was like, so who you are you like, no, like talking to him? Because my wife has to ask him. It's like, I'm my, it's my friend and like, uh, he's, like, she knows him as well. So he's asking about like, some advice on how to like you know manage gaming in their children's lives and so it's like you know, and he's asking you right i mean like absolutely the right person to advise people on how to play games and and she was asking like, so what did you tell him i was like one and a half hour should be enough try to practice this in your own life as well for a change i mean like you know, your mental development definitely did not uh, happen <laughs> so now i know why it didn't happen i'm like okay Oh my goodness, I'm like, you get uh, hammered from left, right to center. I'm like, okay, then I realized, okay, before giving advice to anybody, I think we should uh, set a standard for ourselves. Yeah. Follow before <laughs> you start practice. Also, true. before you breathe. Yeah. True, true. You know, the, the absolute irony, the moment he started saying an hour and a half should be enough, I I, I had the same clip it, going it, on. It, it, it's it's like me and Mamba, <laughs> it's like a court game. Then he's like, a court game. And then we're like, oh. Oh, you no, remember? No, 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 no. I need to. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the, the very first time we played Valorant together, I was very new to the game. And Romeo and I, we sat down at midnight to start playing. Like we will play a game or two. We ended up playing for twelve hours, from and midnight then, to afternoon twelve. Yeah, <laughs> and I think we didn't lose the game. One so we, game we, also, we didn't. I lose. think we lost one at the end. Maybe, yeah, and then we, we, then we were like, games. and then we were like, okay, this is fine. <laughs> one this during this. Uh, like uh, when the game dropped uh, during yeah the the very right? early days very early yeah. days yeah my god How was I think rank wasn't like, even was... a thing at that point was no, it no rank was the the when we were playing actively there was no rank yeah we played it uh, before rank. rank came later right but yeah. how was the experience because I like I was still based on Dubai so I never got to play it like uh, in India right so how did you guys like, what experience what it, like? one of the biggest difference was right the the advantage we had over newer players was we had a bit of the reflex from the FPS games, right? And we knew how to peek. We we used those counter strike boomer <laughs> tactics. <laughs> it's like we were like, you know, you, you do this, you know, let's make crossfires. We knew all of that, right? And we were pretty good at that game. So we and Valorant, of course, that's why you see Shroud or the NA scene kind of uh transitioning so yeah, easily. Yeah, yeah, kind of picking up and then also liking the game so much because uh, NA, of course really love 1.6 and we saw that and we were like dude this is exactly like CS but <laughs> better better in some ways you know and it was fun and then uh, I think when Rang the first act was still okay I think but then you started seeing a lot of people try try harding now because they've picked up a lot of things and I think by the second act we saw that um, the boomers could not kill anymore <laughs> Yeah, because early on, <laughs> like we all look. Yeah, we we didn't know we were, the we were all we were all new, so yeah. we were also learning a lot of the new things. That That's something I was actually going to mention, right? So we knew how to click heads. Yeah. So early on, all we had to do was click heads. That was fine. But the one thing that I really liked about Valorant dropping dropping in, and when the players transitioned from CS:GO to Valorant, a lot of the players who were not able to break into the circuit back in the day, right? In CS, yeah. for example, yeah. or other FPS titles, it was an evil playing field. Every, everyone was new to the game. See, if you played yes. well, if you had the basics yeah. right, you could actually carve a niche for yourself. And that actually happened with a lot of players. A lot of new players came out, they started playing. And that is one thing that I really enjoyed because at the end of the day, if you've not been able to establish yourself because of how tightly, knit the, how closely knit the community is of professional players, because you usually see the same players just change organizations or teams and it's the same bunch of players that have been playing through decades and new players, it's, it's just, tough for them to break in into the circuit so that was one thing that i really liked the experience was actually quite nice 
but i think early days nobody really cared nobody was as toxic because nobody knew how to play the yeah. game but yeah let me let me quickly transition and pivot into a very serious topic right now because we we've, we've had our share of fun now this is something that scares all of us as gamers yeah. is is pe- people in power or the bureaucrats or the government right the lack of exposure of bureaucrats or people in power in the government to esports and gaming and all the stories that we hear with um sometimes parents not being responsible enough with bank access to the kids spending too much money and it it resulting in not so good things and just the general atmosphere and the perception of esports right and also at the same time there are fantasy leagues advertising themselves as esports which also creates one more problem and subconsciously uh, associates esports with with fantasy betting does it is this an irrational fear that just Romeo and I have or is it something that you also have what if some day someone in power just wakes up and is like you know what let's just ban esports as a whole i think that's a very valid question right and it has to like you no know, that's the reason why i think a lot of uh, companies don't want to like you know, operate in uncertain business environments right so, so they do not really know if their investment is going to be safe uh, especially when there are no uh, not like a wild wild west but let's say to the whims and fantasies of what's the flavor of the day is right uh, from the perspective i'm like that's definitely a concern for people who have uh, who want to enter into india and probably do not have the kind of uh expertise or experience with the way that indian system works uh but uh, from what we have experienced is and also like you know from our conversations with like um, a lot of experts in our well, not experts but let's say bureaucrats uh, let's say from what we hear and what we engage with i think it's very positive to the point where i think uh, early this year there was a clear demarcation even in the parliament about like what is uh Uh, like how do you look at uh, games which do not have uh, competitive elements like the way that traditionally we associate with these sports and what is fantasy right so i think there's a clear demarcation now and as far as uh, regulations etc so we we definitely welcome that and i think it is going to come right and it is going to come in the right spirit right and i think this is something which uh, we all as the industry right so right from the publisher from let's say uh like from TOs from players from everybody's interests have to be protected right because this is a legitimate industry we are working in and we definitely want all of our interests protected and our voices heard right and it is not as uh, chaotic as we would like to believe the way that the uh, government machinery works right so you know it takes a lot of time from uh, that's a proposing a law to uh, actually implementing uh, the law right and it goes through my, multiple iterations drafts and i i think uh, there are some positive steps that will be taken in the next uh, let's say in the, in the foreseeable future where we will see uh, clear guidelines right so now i think uh, last year uh, because of xyz incidents there are, now there is a very clear indication of what data policy is going to be like right? for any kind of uh, companies which collect user data and how are they expected to treat that data and manage that data right so now it is going to be a law or it's going to be a draft is when we propose right and similarly we see the same thing happen for uh let's say esports slash fantasy gaming both of them are very different businesses and i think they have each of them have their own right to do business um and we believe that as long as uh, it doesn't cannibalize and there's a clear guideline of how each of them can do business it will be a welcome move and yes this is something which we also like you know uh, go iterate a lot internally as well saying hey how is the future going to look like and from whatever we have seen we believe that it is moving in the right direction and we have full confidence in the whole machinery of bureaucracy and especially people that we know who are going to like to drive this to have enough confidence to know that like no they are not i mean like i'll not say not aware they are very aware and uh and like they are a generation ahead of us uh so they are they have gone through multiple like no iterations of like taking into new uh, industries and making the regulations around it telecom for example right? although we don't see that it's perfect but at least like not it um, there are now regulations around uh, telecom right and that's the same thing that's going to happen for every new industry and yes there are fears that sometimes it might not go in the way that we believe that it should go but that doesn't mean that uh, it, it will not happen it will happen and we welcome and we have trust that the machinery that is the bureaucracy and uh, the governments that they will take the right decisions and will make sure that like you know, we have the clear guidelines of what the playground is so we will know 
when we can bat, when we can bowl, where we can feel, and how can we get out. That's actually quite fair. But Roma, before before I uh, you know let you go on with any other questions, I actually have two questions which are very important to me, and I believe Romeo as well, and, and all the all the listeners to the podcast. Uh, two very different questions, but I I want to hear this from a perspective of a publisher, because you know you can this uh, you can distinguish between the two over here. One is a very moral question about how kids uh, you know spend a lot of yeah. money on skins, and h- how do you it's not even tackle tackle a problem. It's, it's it's not really your problem because you lay out the guidelines. And at the end of the day, it's up to the parents to enforce those guidelines. But is it something that you guys still think about? Like, hey, man, uh, sure, my game might be rated for somebody who's about 16 or 18. But what if a 13-year-old kid goes on and spends 20,000 or 30,000 rupees in the game, in, in the game, buys skins? And the second question, again, a very different question from the first one is, what do you think of governing bodies in esports? and yeah. How would you, if if you would allow somebody to govern how the players are, uh, are are going forward for something like Valorant or maybe League of Legends? How do how do you tackle these uh, these two things? Yeah, the first thing I think it's it's uh, it is something which we take uh, very seriously as publishers. I think it's we are all waking up to the fact that uh, earlier the access to the game was uh, fairly with a mature audience, people like who had let's say experience in know what they're doing right especially when it comes to pc and console uh but now with mobile just uh breaking all the rules right it has broken all the rules and now the chances and, and it is not an easy thing to control right because uh if you have to service like 10 million versus like uh 1 million it's, it's a different ball game right the scale is different this checks and balances because new uh, challenges will come up suddenly right now you have like uh, kids as young as 12 uh, although it's it is a boon of the digital what you call uh, age that we can uh, now it's not a pain to transact anymore, but also it comes with a lot of challenges, of, especially when it comes to like you know, uh, uncontrolled or unsupervised transactions inside the game, right? So this is something which I think, um, and that's the reason one uh, why uh, we want to really like you know double down on the way that we want to approach mobile uh, for a large market as India, where we know that like you know, the chances of uh, even like a small incident becoming snowballing into something really big is very high, right? So, and for uh, for every, I mean, like, you know, if the way that we approach uh, launching in the market is also to say, hey, what are the things that we need to be mindful of for these regions while servicing the players? So it's basically like cultural sensitivity, making sure that we have, we follow all the rules and legal logical requirements that are needed, and we are enabling everything that is needed for the game to be experienced correctly, right? And that also includes uh, what are the checks and balances to make sure that, like, you know, that uh, the victim is not our players, right? So I don't have a really, like, strong answer on saying how are we going to do it, but we do have some approaches, right? Saying at what point of time do you, like, you know, notify or inform people that uh, need to know that hey things are being done maybe there's a like a cool down period after like you purchase x number of amount of like let's say maybe a cap saying okay uh maybe a one single transaction of what is the maximum that you can purchase uh for a skin let's say let's just hypothetically let's say thousand rupees okay uh the moment you transact that you definitely get a cool down where you will not be able to transact for maybe X number of hours or whatever, unless and until there's some other way to like, no, to really confirm that this was a conscious purchase and anything that goes beyond a certain amount, you hold, withhold the purchase till it is actually double confirmed by the owner of like, you know, the bank account or the card. So there are a lot of ways to like, you know, to, uh, to make sure that like, you know, it is done correctly. And this is definitely uh, something that we will be super mindful about when we want to approach mobile in markets like India, where uh, the impact of these uh, like these kind of like events is is traumatic, right? So not just for uh, like you know, for the child. I mean, like you know, even for the parents. I mean, they have to go through a lot of stress, you know, because the fallout from like this can have real impact, both in economical terms as well as uh, psychologically, right? Because we have events, uh, things like, hey, the kid ran away from home because without knowing he spent X number of lakhs of rupees from the account and now he doesn't want to face the parents, right? So these are real problems. And I, th- I think uh, we need to be really mindful that uh, these things 
can happen. Even if they don't happen, that's that's different. Yeah. But uh, you have to share the responsibility. And I think the biggest responsibility is also with the parents, but at the same time, the publisher has to make sure that there are enough tools available for those checks and balances to make, to be effective, right? And this is a conversation that you definitely continue having. And of course, like we all like you know, want to make money out of our products, but not at the cost of, let's say, somebody's uh, health or life for the matter. Right? And we will we will figure out uh, multiple ways to do that and hopefully like know that uh, we will never have to face or nobody who plays or enjoys our games have to face kind of similar kind of events and incidents. So, so that's part one of your question right what was the second part again <laughs> you know but on it before you move on to the second one uh, it's it's quite touching that publishers are now finally considering this because it's it's been a massive problem that we've all wanted to discuss yeah. and at the end of the day i think uh, uh, Three of us having this conversation are privileged enough to be in a position where if you want a skin, we can buy it without having to worry about anything else. Yeah. But kids who've just started off, they need to be really careful. But the second part of the question was governing bodies in esports. We've we've Ooh. had uh, oh this my is, god, that's gonna make a lot of people unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is something that we we need to talk about. Yeah. Uh, this is <laughs> yes, of course. And uh, funnily enough, I think Romeo and I, we both posted on our Instagram, say, man, we have a podcast coming out. And uh, I think we both of us use similar language that, sure, a podcast is going to make a lot of people unhappy. But at the end of the day, we need, we want, not even need, we, we want the next generation of gamers to know what mistakes not make. Or what, what are the mistakes that we've made and what are the mistakes that the community has made as a whole so that we can improve from this point on. So... What what's your take on uh, governing bodies in general? And we've we've seen some of them in India as well. Haven't worked out really well. But what do you think, as 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 a publisher or a, or a personal opinion? Uh, yeah, I mean, like you know, so I I think I'll just give you uh, my personal opinion because so most of the markets that uh, we work and operate in, most of them have uh, governing bodies, especially when it comes to like you know esport federations. Uh, and we want the players to be protected, the interests of the players to be protected, right? And I think it's important for uh, some kind of, let's say, organization that is looking out for uh, players and talent as well, because at the end of the day, it's an industry, right? So we are uh, benefiting from this industry, but at the same time, we have to also play by the uh, rules, although we might believe that this is fair, but it might not meet the fairness uh, criteria of the market itself, right? So if we believe this is a fair way for us to like you not know, to give back to the players the market says no this is not enough this needs more so it, it, it is it is very uh, dependent on market to market and for a market like india i, I think um, publishers have to definitely have a lot of responsible uh, responsibility in the way that uh, people are experiencing their games and how they're exploiting the game I mean, like you know, not exploiting in the <laughs> negative sense of the word, but exploiting as in like you know, using the game for a commercial purpose, right? I think this is the bare minimum that every publisher can do uh, when it comes to their IP usage, right? How are you going to use the IP? Um, like you know, you want to do a like you know, a stream on our game, right? How should I approach this? Should I allow it? Should I ask you for a royalty fee if somebody wants to do an event? Do I want to like you know, charge you money for it? Uh, if, uh, let's say, uh, if the TO says, hey, I want to do an event, but for the event, I'm going to charge every player who's going to pay uh, like 100 bucks, but I'm going to give uh, 20 bucks in return as a price. Would you allow that? So all these things, I think, uh, and luckily, I mean, like, no, as right, we had, uh, we have a lot of experience in, like, you know, because we are also an esport company. We're not just a game publisher, we're an esport company. And we have uh, been able to, like, look at, multiple models and have some very solid guidelines on how our IPs can be used, right? Uh, and while we don't want to like say how other IPs can be uh, used by, let's say, people in the industry, but for our IPs, we are very clear. Uh, we will always put the players first. We'll always play, put people who are enjoying our products and services first and what is best for them. That's what we will put it out ourselves and also expect our partners to uh, adhere to guidelines, right? And, and of course, like, you know, uh, everything to do with uh, labor laws, like, you know, discrimination, etc. we will try to, like, you know, put those things out in the place already. So you don't really need to have a governing body to, let's say, uh, to come and say, this is how a game can be built around an experience, right? So we already have those in place, right? So if you ask me, 
uh, do we need somebody to like you know, tell us uh, if there's a governing body that helps uh, let's say manage conversations with let's say with uh, the governments or government entities then more than welcome right because we definitely like to engage and see how can we like you now build the ecosystem together but if you ask me like you know, if there is no governing body will people be able to like you know, misuse our game or misuse people who are building experiences around the game highly unlikely because that is not how we would let uh, anybody like you now take advantage of let's say not having a governing body so i hope that answers your question right so saying we have already thought about it and we have very fair usage about how our ips can be used and we are very strict about making sure that like, you know, at the end of the day we always put our players first and people who are building experiences investing into those right and we want to make sure that their interests are also taken care of and we look at that model as our way of uh, working and if somebody wants to like you know use this as the benchmark for let's say hey this is how a governing body should be we are more than happy to like you know, to share the information and knowledge but uh, even if there's no governing body we will definitely make sure that our ips are have fair usage and nobody is like you not know, uh, discriminated or let's say made disadvantage of because of let's say lack of a governing body or rules no that's that's fair i mean this is this is one of the things i actually noticed as well when i was playing last year is even in in, in tournaments in india itself right for valorant tournaments if there were multiple events happening on the same day there was always scheduling where right themselves were involved making sure that there are no matches being clashed so yes. if a team had two matches in two different tournaments on the same day there was no those practically zero chance that they would have to play those two matches at the same time it's a very small thing but the the level of detail that you guys went to i think that's deeply appreciated in the community yeah and i i think uh, we can't hide it right because player support pe we get tickets no? <laughs> 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 uh, uh, come directly like, yeah, yeah, kya ho raha hai ye kya ho raha hai ye kya ho raha hai kya ho raha hai kya ho raha hai i mean like i get tickets man i mean i have to deal with those tickets i mean like how do i i mean like i can't uh, ignore ki nahi ek player hai no baba every and the thing is like it comes um, on our systems man it's very difficult to like you know to um, to say what are you know these are very important things they are highlighted they are let's say discussed on uh, <clears throat> like forums on slack as well right saying hey uh, there seems to be a problem and uh, of course like you know you have a lot of um, people who weigh in and also like give advice and say hey maybe this is what it needs to be done so it's very proactive so the moment a player ticket comes at the region locked and whoever is responsible for the domain just gets it on the slack channel and on email so there's no way to run away from it and so it also means that uh, we are so used to dealing with uh, let's say the way that people are creating those experiences that we are hey, you know agle baar se let's make sure that they don't happen so it's already like uh, systems are evolving constantly right and and this is the reason why when we build a calendar we say okay uh, mr so and so mr so and so miss so and so you know this is a link this is our calendar of events which date kaun sa time pe hai broadcast everything is detailed there you know what when you plan your event just be mindful that there is somebody else who's planning or already booked that slot don't do it right but like now if you have constraints because your brand wants to have it on a specific day let's sit down and try to talk to whoever is running the other event let's see if there can be some adjustments that can be made so that both of us come out a little unhappy but not fully happy or fully unhappy right so this is the way that we try to enable things rather than you know what acha concentrate nahi ho sakta sorry it becomes uh, very uh, i mean like and then the, everyone's build a business around our ip and we want we love that and like we love people coming up to us and say hey on one event fantastic so how can we help right uh, just don't ask for prize money right? <laughs> <laughs> but this is something that romeo also mentioned to me like when uh, he was educating me about right this was again early days of valent because i've always been a hardcore fps fanatic and for everybody who started in the early 2000s or mid 2000s there's only been one fps or maybe quake or cs that they started off with and the grassroots level engagement right romeo is is something that uh, is very important because At the end of the day, you don't want monopolies in esports. It's not about 
one person or two people having power it's about being as inclusive as you can be and this is something that we all actually try to avoid is having monopolies in esports because it doesn't end well it just does not yeah it doesn't end yeah absolutely I mean, like I, I, and i think like you know uh, we have seen this right i mean like you know it's it's a big it's a big market like you always say right the 1.4 billion people and with half of them still to come online and maybe 30, even if 30% of them turn into like active gamers out of which let's say even if 1% of them turn competitive then it's it's a market that you can build so many experiences right and so there's i think called a mocha monopoly kar lo ye what is the monopoly <laughs> every brand will work with you only you will not get anybody i mean if you somebody is planning an event then yeah, i'll do an event at the same time same date no i think it's it's for the publisher to make like i was saying right or it was it's a responsibility of the publisher to make sure that like uh i think this is one thing which uh, i have to really uh, mention akshat right so i i think uh, akshat well i was like having this conversation with him very early on i think like uh, last year right so i was just talking to him hey akshat like you know let's, let's sit down and like you know, figure out uh, what should we do about like you know how can we build a grassroots uh, scene for valorant because like you know uh, i want to build something but i my i have limited resources but i really want to like make sure that everybody gets uh, a fair chance at this ip because everybody's at ground level there is no big daddy there is no minion everybody has uh, space and like you know, we will be giving them a fair set of playground or play items to play with is that like you know, okay do one thing just put yourself as you are the parent publisher na to bap hai matlab as you are the, not the bap but the parent of uh, the game and everybody who wants to do something around it are your children right so you have to like look at how would you approach your own children when it comes to their needs and their wants right you have to give time to everybody listen to everybody make sure that everybody gets a fair shot at success and you also are able to like you know benefit from their journey because at the end of the day you are enabling them so that like they enable you as well right and there's a fantastic piece of advice i'm like i i use that as the cornerstone right whenever there is let's say hey how do we approach it pehle just put yourself into the role of let's say hey what am i going to do i'm going to approach this whole project as 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 a lot of uh, as as a parent and i have like lots of uh, let's say children in the class who want something out of it so how do i make sure that everybody gets a fair chance of success right? social one one that's fair though that's that's that's, that's quite fair what is your take romeo I I I mean I'm all up for grassroots man. Capitalist, yeah. I I I. उसको बोला कि whoever gives me money gets it. Stand for me, like you know, stand for me. Romeo is like. ऐसा दे event ले. Yeah, we're like where 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 are the skins? Where are the skins? Man? Yeah, where Seriously. are the skins? So. I I just have one last question. I think I've asked everyone who've come here on and you know on the show. I've asked Patrick, I've asked Blay also like. So I'm just going to ask you like because a lot of people who tune into us are very young and they actually want to get into esports maybe as a pro player or a caster or aspiring it could it could be anything right but now there's so many avenues in esports right there's if someone could work in publishing someone could work as a marketer what would what kind of advice would you want to give like if you know i mean we've all have made mistakes right in the whole path in our career like what would be some advice you would like to give them who's who's actually listening or who's who wants to get into the whole esports bandwagon yeah yeah well i'm mean, like i, I think uh, a lot of cliche things i can say right something like, because i think uh, <laughs> it's easy to get away with uh, a lot of the cliches uh, <laughs> but uh, I think the way to approach this is to uh, keep evolving, right? I mean, like you know, esports is is very it's a very huge domain, right? And like I said early on, like I understood, I realized for myself that I could not. Uh, I'll be even even if I try competitive uh, myself, and I will probably go to a certain level, and after that, like there is no question of me being elite. I will probably be a, a good competitive player, but uh, is that my potential, right? and this is where i think uh, they have whoever wants to get into this esport uh, always have to look at saying what understand what is the thing that they can potentially achieve 
in their initial start journey, right? So if I want to start off as a competitive player, okay, I know that I have, this is where I can hit. And this is where I, if I like, you know, put 10% more, I can probably reach the next level, right? So the point is like, you know, that to, uh, to really reflect on that and understand where you want to be. And after that, like, you no, know, look at everything else that is out there, right? And all of us, like, you know, now we started off as very different uh, set of people in esports, while we're still connected to esports, we do very different things, right? And the journey is equally satisfying, right? And there is no, uh, there's no, uh, there's no, let's say, I don't say shame, there's no um, regret saying if I could never do well uh, as, as a professionally competitive player doesn't mean that I cannot enjoy these sports or cannot be part of the industry itself, right? I think this is uh, something which a lot of our upcoming players and people who want to be competitive is saying like, you know, chart out your life. You don't, your life uh, as a competitive player will probably last five to 10 and would be a stretch, but five years uh, and best, right? Beyond that, I think if uh, the idea is to like look at this whole industry and 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 just try to like you know, see what makes you happy, right? And uh, in five years, you'll have enough insights into yourself. And there's so many things that are exciting. Um, and like I started off as a wannabe competitive player, and right now I'm super excited by just being able to bring competitive experience to players, right? Gamers, and that's I think the biggest motivation for me. Saying whatever I do not experience myself. I want to make sure that like you now people uh, who are enjoying our games get those experiences, right? And for me, that is a motivation, right? I, do I have regrets about uh, not being a not being a competitive player or never being successful? I, hell no, I'm like I don't. I've, it's only when I look at photos that I realize, oh, I used to be competitive, right? But uh, I don't have any regrets. I know that like you know, that uh, I did what was uh, right for me at that point of time and. Whenever I had to switch lanes, I switch lanes. And so I guess the journey is uh, both of self-discovery at the same time, apply, applying whatever you've learned for yourself and still being able to like, you know, get a lot of joy out of like uh, being part of the esports industry and journey. Right? So this is the only, uh, what do you call, uh, advice that I might have. Uh, it might uh, not make a lot of sense. Uh, because I, I think everybody wants to be the next Sazam, right, or Kenzi. So it is very difficult to let them know, you know what, you can also do <laughs> streaming. It's like, Nate and asking, I don't want to stream. I want to like, no, look at people, like, and people should look at me playing games. I'm like, no, I don't want to stream. So it's a different mindset. I think uh, uh, the industry is big enough, and we would love to have more people who are genuinely interested and want to do things, right? We don't want, like, a lot of people who are, not really connected to the industry, running the show. We would rather have people who have really experienced right from the grassroots come up and say, you know what, there's one thing that I really want to make a change. And uh, I think the industry will give you that shot, right? And we would love to have more people like that rather than people with like, you know, with a very set of like PNL and language. I want to do a PNL off place industry. I want to like, you know, sell a brand sponsorship. Yeah, we love that as well. But uh, we want people who really come and like make a difference to our lives as well, right? And somebody who you can like be on a flight for five hours and still not feel bored. And this, this is it, man. Like an interesting life. Every, all of us have very interesting lives. And uh, we should be able to like you not know, create stories around our own lives and we are the heroes and the heroines of our what call, our own life and let's 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 uh, make it a great game man quite a profound answer right there right Romeo? for for for, yes. for for gamers and esports enthusiasts uh, end goal is not money while well, money is very important money is the means to live our dreams to do what yes. we wanted to do and to give those opportunities that we've maybe not had or we've had, but we were not able to make the most of it to the next generation. And uh, yeah. that is the difference between somebody who just looks at the balance sheet and runs an, runs an organization or a gamer being, you know, being at the helm of the company and making sure the right decisions are being tabled. Money is the means to living our dreams. And I think with that being said, uh, the, I think the kids these days say this, apna time aaga, but I believe apna time aaga at this point because yes, yes, yes. the... the the, the the junction that at, at which we're standing right now with esports and gaming in, in the country and honestly it makes me quite emotional saying this is is it's just the beginning it's not even one percent of our full potential and the opportunity is that this generation the next generation of gamers and the generation after that is going to have is going to be massive but with that being said so come up thank you so much we really appreciate your time and uh i enjoyed this conversation I'm i not did, sure about I, you. did. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love the conversation oh. a lot of fun
Absolutely, man. I like when uh, Romeo told me like a couple of weeks back that we're gonna do it. I said, oh, let's do it as soon as possible. Like, <laughs> the B- BCC is done, and I'm so happy that like you now I finally time to like you know, to really go back and uh, talk about uh, not just this journey but this experience. Also, like why I'm so excited, right? Yeah. So a lot of things I'm like I can't wait for 2022 to start, man. I'm like just wait. Okay, New Year, khatam ho ya, Christmas holidays. Let me go and meet family so that I can come back and like you know like uh, open up a bag of surprises right so that's something which i'm so excited about and it's funny thing that you mentioned that like apna time aage hai so uh, i mean like one of the things that we wanted to do for the launch of the mumbai server was actually come up with a rap song right which is basically oh. the same thing right Ap- apna time aage hai right that was Ooh. the that was the point right so we had done a lot of uh, i mean like you know creative you know, call, uh, play around that and we went through like artists who can deliver the punchline right and also like uh, how would you like bring that up and i'm a get story to like really uh let's say they come to life right but because of like a lot of issues we could not really do that campaign but that would be a, one of my dreams man i would like to really do a like a big roadmap announcement for the region with the like, cycling up and i'm again man and like you know why oh, there is nothing called uh Yeah, but like just imagine, like you know, we drop a like a raw roadmap from Riot, and we it's like from an artist, and then like you know, the whole team goes to like after time has come, and it, it's not a like you, know, you don't have to wait anymore. I mean, I, that's I, that's great localized content plus roadmap plus press coverage plus everything. <laughs> yes, plus everything, <laughs> and a lot of lawsuits from saying yeah, you're not yet to me. I am sure there are other publishers will be like ha humne isliye nahi kiya tha yeah yes they will like thanks much <laughs> gaye yeah oh but what a fun time honestly we uh, i had a perception that this conversation is going to be very formal we'll like come and we'll talk about boring topics like hey yeah these are the problems these are the issues but i think we didn't like romeo and i we, before we before we got on the google call right you we are discussing hey what, are, what what do we do about the intro and i told him you know what dude i'm sick why don't you take the intro for for today <laughs> and we come in and we just start talking like you know what we don't want an intro right we'll just we'll just roll with it and that's what we do at lead talk yeah we just get we just get cracking we try to keep it as free wheeling as possible just start how although the although we have an intro which we have never used <laughs> We, and intro we spent thirty minutes recording. Yeah, by the way. we we and that's when and I told Ma, and then Mamba laughed and I said I said your job is so hard. <laughs> I said I yeah. can't even do a fucking intro here. Like I can't I I couldn't even say I'm like Mamba. He kaise karta hai? And then I remember shit. I remember the times when I used to give you a script. I used to write a script and I'm like read this. Then he's like, My God. yeah, that's yeah, when I'm, I'm like. like <laughs> So I, I, I'm a big fan of you guys. I'm mean, like, you know, I've been following the, I'm like, you know, the whole uh, lead conversations. I'm mean, like, you no, know, that's the, my uh, earlier. I whenever I used to play um, the uh, Legends of Rune Terra in office, I used the illusion to like some music on the background. But now I just put on the. Oh. Uh, I just put on the podcast <laughs> and uh, like, uh, like I think I'm on two percent of episode three. Uh, yeah. So it's been great. I'm like, so I was telling Romeo that you know what, you should definitely um, when uh, it's possible. So you when you have when you go to a like you know, big enough setup where you are inviting people to like come on over and like have a physical talk and talk. I want to do a Joe Rogan on you guys, man. I want to like, no, oh, say, mom, I made it. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I, it's 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 really a very big call. I, I did remember. I did tell mom, but when we were shortlisting the guests, yeah, I I, I did mention you, and I was like. We need someone from Ryan and like Sukumar is like I and I and you were on your vacation so I was like I don't think I should ask him now it's not a, <laughs> it's not the right time I'm like let me bother him yeah. after a month yeah it was a great vacation by the way guys I'm like no so we did a whole road trip I mean like we left the kids with the grandparents and so we just picked up the small car I'm like the car was ours. So and we started all the way from uh, south of Germany. That's where my in-laws live, and we crossed the Alps. So the uh, the whole motivation was to cross the Alps, like Hannibal, right? Remember that Arctic army of elephants that crossed the Alps, right? So we wanted to, like, you not know, do the whole road trip over the Alps, uh, cross over to the Italian side of the Alps, and then uh, drive all the way to Venice, and then like, you know, spend a week there, and then go to like uh, Verona. And then from Verona, you go to the like uh, this place, Lake Garda, and then after that, you go to the Alpine forests camp in a very alternative uh, camp, lifestyle camp, and then you drive back. Right? It was fantastic. Loved it. 
I was very jealous. I was very jealous. I was working hard for BCC, man. Sugamal so showed me the, uh, you know, showed me, and I was like, you know, Damn. Romeo, <laughs> you, you, you should send him the pictures from your vacation at the GK or the Blue Tokai. I hate you. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> hey, by the way, Blue Tiger, if you're listening, please uh, sponsor. We're, we're both coffee heads. We we actually are coffee heads to the point where Romeo goes out, grabs his coffee, and I actually got some specialty equipment to brew manually. And I saw this uh, gooseneck uh, kettle with a thermometer in it, and I lost it. I was like, I need this thing. It doesn't matter what I do. This with is it. this is where he spends all his casting money. <laughs> this. Yeah. In fact, like I, I think uh, there's a gentleman like who's a great creator called Peter McKinnon, and like oh, yeah. he's also like coffee. he's a coffee addict like me, and like you know, he has a set of equipment like how you the hipster way basically. Every, yeah. the, the whole setup of making the coffee is like so hipster, it's insane. And like I, I'm a coffee addict too, right? So now I'm trying to like move to decaf uh, because I realized that like it's getting too much, man. Like. Uh, and I'm just trying to like, you know, make sure that like I have some sanity left. Uh, but yeah, I'm like, no, same. I'm like, I'm a big coffee addict. As oh well. God, like, this <laughs> is Roman. I we can't stop laughing. I'm sorry. But before you move to decaf, I have to tell you this. Uh, so there's this coffee called Heisenberg by Saverworks. It's a fermented coffee. You need to try this. If you've not tried it, trust me, you're missing send out him. on life. Send him. I mean, I'll send it to you actually. You know what? Yeah, I'll send, yeah, do you have his address? Ma- Mamba is our, Mamba I, is our I, coffee I, PR. He sends I, it to I, me. I, I, I send it to my colleagues. Of coffee to, to all of my friends. I'm like, dude, have you tried this coffee? You need to try this coffee. So you know what? I'll actually, I'll send you a text or an email. You can, you send me your address. I'll send you a packet of the of Heisenberg. Trust me, it is one coffee. If you've not had, you're missing out on it. It's so, so Jesus good. Jesus Christ. I'm like, what is missing there? Heisenberg, like neither you can predict uh, location or the t- uh, on the velocity, right? Which is that you cannot uh, the uncertainty the principle, right? Heisenberg uncertainty that... principle. Yeah. What, what about uh, what, it? What, what part? What part of the coffee is missing here? <laughs> the the part the, the coffee is just missing from your house. That's it. That is all you oh, need. I'm telling oh, you, guys. <laughs> if you're watching this, <laughs> please sponsor. You need to sponsor this. <laughs> There's a lot of yeah, coffee what? here. Where are they based out of? I'm like, where, where's the company from? Is it uh, from I think it's an Indian company, but not sure exactly where it is. Uh, I've only been buying coffee from one roaster up until this point, which is based out of Jaipur. It's called Curious Life Coffee. But then which I is went amazing. to this, amazing. Which, which is coffee. amazing, by the way. Yeah. yeah. But I went to this cafe, my favorite cafe in Surat. Miraki, huge shout out to you guys. You don't need to sponsor me. I think I've talked about you guys enough. Everybody who knows me knows knows about Miraki. Uh, I went there and uh, I walked over to the barista after a year and a half because I didn't go there because of COVID. The barista recognized me. He's like, "Ek baar gaya tha COVID leke aa gaya matlab." Main udhar nahi. Ye Bombay se koi leke aaya. No, no, I didn't get it from there. Luckily, but I, I told him just get get me something like surprise me. I don't know. So he, he makes me a cup of warm pour over Heisenberg. I have it and I lose it. I'm like, I need to order this right now. I come back home, I order it, and ever since I've not looked back. It's it's been my go-to cup, and it's actually a perfect storm outside over here. But the only problem is I'm quarantined, so I can't really go out and make my cup of coffee. I'm I'm missing it so much. But trust me, you need to try it. It's it's a it's a storm. No, I'm from Surat, but yes, the same storm in Surat and Bombay. Same storm in Mumbai. Yeah, two fifty kilometers. Oh, I'm like, uh, and like, what is your coffee ritual? I mean, like, do you have my coffee ritual? Uh, um, yeah. So usually it's a cup a day, unless I'm casting, then it becomes two cups a day. So I would always make a, I would make it in a French press, but now I've moved to pour overs, learning pour overs. So I usually have it in the evening. Well, fairly simple. I got a grinder. So fresh coffee, like I have beans, grind it freshly, uh, do the entire pour over ritual where you preheat the paper. You make sure the papery taste is out. Your V60 is preheated as well. And then you pour in yeah. the coffee. You try and get the brew time right to 2 minutes, 30 seconds or 2 minutes, 45 seconds, whatever you like according to your taste. And right now, I'm, I'm in the process of trying to figure out how, how fine do I need to grind my coffee for that perfect pour over. Because French press is something I've figured out. I can do that. I use, uh, I think it was 1 is to 16 is what my water to coffee ratio was. And a brew time of uh, roughly about six, six, six and a half minutes. And uh, a 30 seconds of bloom or something like that. And for coffee noobs, bloom is... Be- it's, it all sounds fancy, but it's not. If you have so much in your mind, it's in the breeze wale game. Mein. <laughs> <laughs> Just go on um, the show, man. Like, uh, um, you have gay an amazing hai. sex life, huh? What? Sorry, come again? It sounds like you have an amazing sex life, man. All the details, man. <laughs> <laughs> he, oh my yeah. god, yeah, <laughs> that's a safe pitch to whoever he wants to like you know, hang out with. Like, yeah, this is what I'll do. This is what so... I'll do. <laughs> 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 
But he was very kind. He actually walked me through everything. So I was a total coffee noob. For me, coffee was Nescafe, and now I'm like, no, that's not coffee. That's that's desperation. You don't do that. And next thing I know, I have a lawsuit. But no, 